Welcome to It's the People, a podcast series where we go deep with high octane founders, limited partners, and fund managers, building and growing premier companies and investment portfolios. We hope these interviews enable you to build new muscles and improve your game. This week, my partners Andy Greenfield and Randy Brandoff had the opportunity to interview a seasoned private equity investor and successful entrepreneur. Their guest, Anil Narang, is an entrepreneur who has built, bought, and sold several companies in partnership with private equity funds and institutional debt providers. He currently manages his family office and has over 25 years of experience investing in venture capital, private equity, and credit distress funds. He's a person who loves what he does, feeds off of the investment action, is highly competitive, and extremely detail-oriented. Before we begin, I want to note that this interview is for informational purposes only and that the opinions expressed should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. TI Ventures is a seed stage fund focusing primarily on early stage B2B technology companies with an obsessive focus on end customers and early teams. So to get rolling, Anil, can you compress your life into perhaps a minute or two so we can have a little picture of uh, Anil the man. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Andy. So uh, let's see, when uh, when I left college, I decided um, that um, I was going to give um, entrepreneurialism a, a, a chance. And so I, uh, I took a job out of college, um, but it didn't last very long. Um, I was looking for something to build or buy, and I came across... Um, uh, a company in the music industry that was a very simple, boring um, distributor of pre-recorded music. And I ended up um, teaming up with um, a friend who was a little bit older and wiser than me. And um, and together we, we basically did a roll up of um, distribution companies and, um, and uh, along the way attracted um, private equity into the business. And I was in my, my mid twenties and didn't really have you know, a huge amount of experience in the capital markets, um, but that all changed when when Bain Capital invested in the business, and you know, I had access to some really smart people, and we, you know, proceeded to take a, um, you know, a very small company and, and turn it into a much bigger company and a much more interesting company, in the sense that we we did uh, 28 acquisitions over a period of about five years that m- made us more of an intellectual property owner than a distributor of music and really kind of unlocked the value um, that existed in that asset. Um, and I was hooked. And so um, you know, that company, uh, to make a long story short, went public. Um, you know, at its peak, it was an $800 million company, you know, very profitable. And um, when I exited that company, I wanted to do nothing more than do it again. Um, and I did. And I and so I I kind of you know, moved across several industries. I was in the music industry. I was in the magazine industry. I've been in the education and training industry, back in the music industry, in the business publishing industry. But the common thread has been that I've, you know, always liked to, you know, put my equity to work. And I learned, you know, over time how to turbocharge my equity by using other forms of, um, you know, uh, financing in the capital markets. I also um, started my family office um, after selling the first business. And so again, along the way, I tended to gravitate towards the asset class that I, you know, I understood and liked most, um, which was equity, you know, in the, you know, sort of early to growth stages, and then ultimately, you know, some later stage equity investing. Super, that's really, a really helpful picture. And I'm curious if we gathered together two or three folks who knew you really well, and had watched you over the last 30 years, how would they describe the Narang model of investing? They would describe it as um, very cautious um, and very um, intense in terms of diligence on the way in and um, very aggressive um, during the ride. In other words, I, I would say, you know, when I'm investing as as a principal or as a sponsor um, in businesses that I control, you know, I, I, I tend to make sure that there's no rock that goes unturned because, 
I don't have the benefit of reading, you know, a Blackstone prospectus or something, you know, to get all my risk factors and concerns out of the way. And so there's an awful lot of kind of hanging around the hoop, you know, making a lot of calls, doing a lot of homework. And, um, and then, you know, once the investment is made, you know, it's time, you know, typically to, um, you know, to really execute on, on what are generally very aggressive plans in a fairly compressed time period, which is, you know, something that I learned from, you know, having private equity investors in my early businesses is, is that, you know, the goal as an investor, you know, is obviously to do a great job running the business, um, you know, if you're investing in it. But, you know, when you're a fund manager, it also has to do with, you know, exiting the business and, you know, and generating, um, you know, attractive returns for your investors. You mentioned just now Blackstone Prospectus. You know, I, it's my understanding that you have a history investing with the Blackstones and the KKRs of the world, as well as investing directly. How do you think about your allocation and how do you think about one investment type versus the other, especially for someone like yourself who likes to roll up their sleeves? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I would say the, the majority of the equity investing I do um, would fall into, you know, probably the larger mega fund um, category simply because, um, you know, I, I appreciate that so much of the, of the heavy lifting in terms of the work is done for you. Um, and, you know, and I think the bigger the fund, arguably the less work um, as an LP, you have to do in terms of your own, um, you know, um, you know, individual due diligence. But having said that, uh, you know, I, I tend to, you know, be somewhat contrarian. And so, you know, I'm not always following the herd. And so when, you know, when I'm making um, investments um, directly, and that could take many forms, right? I mean, I can make a co-investment uh, alongside of, say, Blackstone or more likely maybe a, um, a smaller uh, private equity fund than Blackstone, where the minimums are, are more suitable. Um, but when making those co-investments, you have the opportunity to kind of do your own individual due diligence. And I'm always very much um, open and eager to do that. Um, when I make direct investments, which is another flavor, um, where I recently, for example, made a direct investment with a sponsor group into Dun & Bradstreet, um, a couple of years ago in a take private transaction. And, and there, everybody's around the table together and you get to, you know, do your due diligence, um, share your notes, um, you know, figure out what it is that's going to be done as a group. And so I am always, you know, sort of looking to get educated and to be convinced that the thing that's being presented is as advertised. Um, so I, I, tend, I tend to do as much due diligence as is permitted um, which is inevitably going to be a lot more when you're going direct than when you're going through a third party fund. Makes total sense. You know, uh, Anil, given the breadth of things you've invested in, because <clears throat> our sense is you have experience pretty much from the gestation period to the, you know, public end of things. Are there any categories that you avoid now or have been burned by and you say no mas yeah a a absolutely like anybody you know I've, I've had my winners and 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 i've got my losers um everyone likes to talk about their winners but i you know i had my clock cleaned um in the uh energy space uh as as an example and you know i when i make a mistake as an investor i always blame nobody but myself and, you know, um, I made an energy investment through, you know, a big um, institutional, a JP Morgan feeder uh, into a particular fund. I won't mention the name of the fund, but, um, you know, pretty much everything they said and projected, um, you know, at least with respect to that particular um, sector, um, turned out to be wrong. And, and for reasons that were probably not knowable or predictable at the time I made the investment, but I didn't really understand the underlying volatility of the asset class. And so I think I was a little bit too quick to pull the trigger um, because commodities is not what I consider to be within my sphere of expertise. I happened to go into that investment as a, as a way of finding some diversification to offset some other things 
um, in my portfolio. But there, there are examples. I've invested, you know, in companies at a certain stage, like some companies early stage, where I, I made direct investments um, without um, getting to know the principles um, well enough. And, you know, I'll tell you one quick story is I made, I made an investment about four years ago in a company in the cannabis space. Um, and, you know, given the industry um, and given the nature of the investment, I was very much focused on finding somebody that was not a flake or a pimp or an ex-drug dealer, but rather somebody with pedigree and real institutional, you know, um, quality in terms of their um, approach and, you know, and, and the way they were proposing to run and buy some businesses. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, you know, um, the individual turned out to be a sociopath and pretty much took everybody's money <laughs> and, um, and, we, and, we, and we lost our investment. And so there are lessons to be learned, you know, up and down the chain, um, you know, in different, you know, at different stages, uh, different industries. But what I tend to do is, you know, stick now with areas that I understand and to always make sure that um, the appropriate amount of due diligence has been done. Because if you don't do the homework, you're not going to get the grade. Super helpful. Let's, yeah. And that's a, it's an interesting brush you painted that at the industry with. I'm sorry you had that experience, but we've also had some good experiences. We've had some, I've had some great experiences <laughs> in that same industry. So yeah, it definitely. Absolutely. Um, let's stay in early stage uh, venture if we could. I know you've, you know, you've just talked about direct investments. I know you've made fund investments. How do you think about early stage specifically between going direct and with a fund? And in both instances, obviously, the gestation period of the investments can be five to 10 years. Do you view one as preferable that way versus the other? Or just what's your starting approach when it comes to early stage venture? Yeah, no, when it comes to early stage um, ventures, I, I am almost always looking to do it via a fund as opposed to directly. Um, and I, I say that because, um, you know, the, the, the early stage people tend to be, you know, very um, expertise um, sometimes or most of the times when I'm investing in particular areas or, or domains. And, you know, and, and I don't think that's something that, you know, um, you know, that 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 I could do without the benefit of having um, a partner. I mean, just as an example, I, I recently made a commitment to a fund that um, is a future of work fund. OK, and I made that investment right before COVID. And, you know, I mean, the timing could not have been better. And, and the entire charter of the fund is, you know, investing in companies that are basically creating software platforms that can that can um, you know change the way work is done, right? And and so um, I make an investment like that with um, you know full appreciation of the fact that you know probably more than fifty percent of the investments that the fund makes will fail, and so they are very smart. They are doing expert due diligence, and yet they are you know going to have a 50-50 you know shot or outcome in terms of separating winners from losers. If I were to stack myself up against that, you know, I would give myself um, substantially lower odds. Um, I also know that when you're making early stage investments, you know, I think it's the better part of valor to have a deeper pocket than my own, um, because early stage companies tend to be more volatile, more unpredictable. Opportunities arise, and you know, um, to the extent that you want um, capital, which I think is the wrath of God for most early stage companies that it's important to have um, if you're, you know, uh, thinking about investing direct, it's important to have somebody of an institutional size, um, you know, even if it's small beside you um, that um, can club deals together so that you can actually be well capitalized enough to be on that 10 year journey. Um, because my experience is despite the way that most funds are marketed, um, you know, most PE funds, you know, they'll talk about, a, you know, investing the capital over three to five years and then monetizing or harvesting it for, you know, a couple of three years. But, you know, my experience from 25 years is that the average life of, you know, of growth stage funds is probably, you know, close to 10 years and, and you know, and and the venture ones, I mean, the venture deals I'm in, you know, are, are in many cases, you know, closing in on that. 
but the performance, you know, if they're good investment supports it um, because they've got not only, you know, good multiples, but even good IRRs over that long a period of time. So, you know, I think it's very, very important, almost more important um, if you do an early stage investing to have um, a partner that really knows what they're doing than if you're, you know, going with a more mature company. If I could... So, so no, go, Randy. If I could ask one follow-up on that through a slightly different lens. Now, you've clearly, we've mentioned some major names and, you know, investment, you know, big and giant investment funds. And there's advantage in venture in early stage to going with the known entities and the very large funds with big track records. But then when you look at the data... Some of historically to this day, some of the very best performing funds mm -hmm. are folks in their first, second, third fund, you know, not their seventh, eighth, tenth fund. How do you think about allocation between known names and entities versus earlier, you know, earlier funds um, with, you know, with hungry and proven, you know, hungry and proven managers, but not quite the track record of the bigger guys? Well, you know, it's interesting because I would say the best returns that I've that I've generated uh, as as an investor over my sort of 25 um, plus year investment career were in the first 10 years of investing. My returns have probably been safer um, and less volatile in the last 10 years. But in the first 10 years, um, the reason I was able to get outsized returns is because I was able to deploy capital more with um, first time managers or, or you, know, se you know, second fund um, you know, type managers rather than an Apollo or a Blackstone or a KKR. Um, and you know, and, and, and you know, typically when you invest with smaller managers um, you know, that are what I would call subscale, you know, I've found that if you pick the right funds with the right managers, they're pretty damn hungry they're, you know, looking to impress because if they can put some good numbers on the board in their first fund, that's usually the harbinger of the next fund. Um, and, um, and, you know, and then furthermore, I think earlier stage funds tend to be, again, more domain expertise or stage expertise, right? So it could be, hey, we're only doing venture and we're only doing it in future of work or, you know, we're only doing, I had one of my best investments was, you know, in a, in a, in a fund um, in the early 2000s that zeroed in on teen apparel. All they did was teen apparel. And, you know, they put up high 20, low 30 IRRs in the first fund, second fund, you know, and, and, and then they decided we were going to, they were going to expand and raise more money um, and go into apparel in general. And, you know, and quickly the, the, the returns started to come down. They were playing in a much bigger sandbox without the same domain expertise. And so, you know, I was I was really good in the first 10 years of kind of, you know, identifying those, you know, those funds that were at the right stage of their life that had principals who, you know, were very ambitious and hungry. Um, but, you know, by the same token, you know, you have to be super careful Um when you're investing in those kinds of early earlier stage funds, because again, with the bigger funds, you know, you don't it, it it you can take for granted that the service providers, the auditors, the accountants, the custodians and administrators, that they'll all be you know big recognizable names. That may not be the case for the earlier funds, but they may be good service providers. And so the way you avoid a made off type of a situation is, again, you do the homework. You know, you you call them up, you get references, you you know, you have to. Um, you know, you have to really, um, you know, check all the boxes. And and I think if you're good at doing that and you have the time or the bandwidth of the team to do that, there's a lot of benefit with, you know, picking the smaller subscale fund where you have the opportunity, you know, to do SPVs, co-invests, you know, to, you know, um, you know, all kinds of different things and re-up, you know, into their second and third fund. You can't do all those things with the bigger name funds. I know you've probably heard somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 pitches, maybe more in your life, a gazillion pitches. What catches your attention or excites you about a pitch? And, you know, separating the wheat from the chaff, because I'm quite sure you don't invest in everything you get pitched on. So something has to penetrate and 
grab your attention and excite you. What is that? Yeah, for, you know, for, for me, I mean, you know, I, I think I, I'd answer that question mostly in the context of, you know, probably the the the, the small to mid-size, um, you know, managers or, or or if it's a particular, you know, individual or a company, um, you know, because, you know, you're not when when I'm investing in Blackstone, I'm not getting pitched. I'm 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 being given the privilege, you know, to invest my money, you know, for 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 a fee. And by the way, they do a great job. So don't 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 get me wrong. But you know, in hearing pitches, look, I I believe in the old adage that you bet the jockey, not the horse. And to me, you know, when you're getting pitched on, you know, if if it's a fund or if it's a company, um, you know, I look for the principal who is, you know, on the edge of his chair and you who where you can see the enthusiasm coming out of his or her pores. I mean, it's there's got to be a passion. There's got to be a commitment. You almost have to have a dogma to will your plan, you know, into a place where it will succeed. And and it's very hard sort of to, de- to detect that. All, all I can say is that I know it when I see it. And I don't see it nine out of 10 times. I see lots of good companies and lots of decent funds and the numbers look good. And, you know, the track record is right. But, you know, um, you know, it's a difficult process separating and 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 differentiating when you have a good deal flow. Right. And so, you know, when it comes to the pitch, you know, to, to, to me, it's, it's got to be something about the person, because I always think it starts and ends with the person. And if if the person can do something that's very impressionable, if they you know if if it's just their attitude, their demeanor, um, you know their their references, but there's got to be something that really stands out about the person for me. It's it's interesting because you remind me of some of the advice we give entrepreneurs, which is you beat your head against the wall till the wall moves, um, yes. or you die of blood loss. Um, yes. <laughs> You know, just flipping it around, are there red flags? I mean, you're, you're a guy who can now deploy and leverage pattern recognition across a lot of investment categories, managers, et cetera. Any red flags that come to mind when you are evaluating a manager where you go, hmm, no. Yeah. Yes, Um. D- definitely. I mean, look, I, I, I believe you know, that, um, yeah, you, you really need to get to know the manager and, and get to know them on many different levels. Um, you know, and so as part of my diligence process, I try to, you know, get to know managers somewhat socially, see what they see, what they're like after, you know, a couple of drinks. Sometimes that can be, you know, a truth serum serum of, of sorts, uh, which is one of the reasons I really believe you know, in face-to-face um, meetings, um, you, you know, as far as like red flags, I, I take very seriously all ADV, you know, disclosures and and background checks. Um, you know, if there've been any regulatory um, infractions, you know, I, 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 I'm a person that completely believes in second chances, just not when it comes to my money. Um, and, and so I've had like anybody else, you know, um, my share of, um, Winners and losers, as I said, and I've had some bad experiences where, you know, you, you, you try and convince them yourself that someone has changed stripes, but oftentimes, you know, history has a way of repeating itself, particularly with respect to people. Um, I, all, I often look for misalignment of interests. Um, you know, I've invested, you know, or looked at investing in funds where I think the manager is not investing enough, um, where they have the resources, but, you know, they don't appear to be willing to eat their own cooking. Um, and that concerns me. Um, you know, I, I, I am concerned about investing with managers who are getting rich off a management. Um, I have a very close friend, you know, whose uh, advisory board I was on when he launched a hedge fund, not a, not a private equity fund. And, you know, and, and several years after launching it, it was a a $15 billion AUM fund. And, you know, I kept thinking to myself, well, you know, with $300 million of management fees a year rolling in, you know, you don't have to do much, you know, to make an awful lot of money. Um, and and so I don't like, you know, uh, the wrong kind of, you know, kind of sort of fee structure. Um, 
Other red flags, lack of communication. I, I find sometimes when things aren't going great, particularly in smaller managers, um, you know, they, they develop the bunker mentality of just not showing their faces that often or communicating as much. And so I think, you, you know, um, if, 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 a, if, a, if a manager doesn't have a history of consistent, you know, clear, concise communication, not just when things are going bad or when things are going good, that's a problem. Um, I mentioned before, you know, um, service providers, like if, 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 if someone's using, you know, their cousin as the accountant, you know, don't walk, run. Uh, and it's the cousin may be a great accountant, but independence matters, you know, conflicts matter. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that those are, you know, the, the, the key things. The one last thing I'd say about a manager, it, and this and this came up a bunch for me, um, you know, before 08 was, you know, I had a bunch of managers running money for me, you know, who, who were my age or sometimes younger, and none of them had ever seen a recession. None of them had ever worked through a difficult environment. And so to me, in the fullness of time, you know, you want to see managers that have navigated their way through treacherous waters, whether that be dislocation in their industry, whether it be, you know, uh, a difficult uh, economic environment, a pandemic. Um, so, yeah, th those are the kind of things I would be fo focused on mostly. It's your answers are so full. It's not like you leave a softball to follow up with. It's more just like, all right, he's nailed it. Like, let's move on to something else. <laughs> how about, so smart. I was yeah. going to say, how about that great line? I believe in second chances, except not with my money. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, you know, there's, there's nothing like making mistakes, guys. It's really the truth. Um, and, and that's especially true when you're investing your money. So, um, and man, yeah. so let, let me ask you this. And couldn't agree more just as, you know, when we look to invest in early stage businesses, we require and demand, uh, you know, regular communication and we want what we call radical candor. You should expect the same of the fund managers and the funds you're invested in. But let's segue that towards performance. You know, they're mm -hmm. giving you regular updates and you want to know how they're doing. And obviously in a in an early stage venture game where we just talked about homework is ultimately graded on returns and that could take 10 years. What do you look for in the earlier years to measure performance? And, in, and for one example, are you more focused on the notion of IRR versus MOIC or MOIC or what, what, it, what are the indicators for you that, that this is going to turn out well five years hence versus con causes for concern? Yeah, no, that's a, that that's another good one. Um, I, I look for me, um, you know, I as 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 a as an investor that is investing, um, his own family capital as opposed to other people's money. Um, my focus is almost, um, well, I wouldn't say singularly, but it's mostly on um MOIC. Um, my my my, you know, the old joke is, you know, you can't eat an IRR. You can have a great IRR, but it may not represent much in the way of absolute dollars. And, and, and therefore, you know, lots of family offices are fo focused on um, multiples of invested capital. Um, but, you know, the, my, my concern with just focusing on, in, on, on multiple invested capital is obviously, you know, it, it disregards or entirely discounts time value of money. And, and, and so, you know, what, what, I, what, I tend, what I tend to do is, is, is really you know, look at a, a blend of kind of three performance metrics, I would say, um, when evaluating um, fund managers, and, and, and that would be MOIC, IRR, and very importantly, DPI, you know, which is distributed um, capital to paid in capital, you know, um, and, 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 you know, again, when, when you're investing with multi-billion dollar large private equity funds, you know, I can lean back sometimes and, 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 you know, and not have to worry about, you know, what that, um, what, you know, what that combination of those three things looks like at any given point in time, because there is a recipe that is often followed pretty carefully um, and pretty consistently. And um, there are best practices to make sure that, you know, that, you know, absent some kind of a calamity that usually does not get out of whack. Where things can get out of whack, in my experience, is generally with, you know, kind of the mid cap, the smaller cap, you know, funds, venture funds, even some growth funds. And, you know, there, what I tend to focus on 
you know, is is less IRR probably in the early stages and, you know, more MOIC and DPI. Because what I what I like to know, usually in my diligence, I feel pretty comfortable that, you know, that the GP or the team are really good investors and they know their sector and that they're, you know, going to, you know, get the right deal flow and pick the right, you know, companies to invest in. Um, what I what I what I don't know is if they're good fund managers, okay? Because that's a different kettle of fish from being a good investor. And so, being a good fund manager, and Andy and I often have this conversation, means you know that in addition to being a good buyer, you have to be a good seller. And lots of times, particularly in earlier stage companies where the growth, you know, curve is you know the slope is pretty steep, it's easy to fall in love with those companies and. You know, see the higher attract, you know, higher valuations, the higher MOICs, the higher IRRs, you know, but 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 those are all unrealized, right? And 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 so what you want to do is be able to also look at realized returns. And so DPI basically allows you to see that, you know, say five years out, if a manager's got a, you know, sort of two X mark um and on 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 the investment and a, you know. 15 or 20 percent IRR, you know, um, but a DPI of zero, you know, I would say, well, you know, there sounds like they're doing everything right, but you know, I'll believe it when I see it. I, I want to see them sell these businesses. I want to see that they are disciplined, that they know how to sell, that they, you know, um, get deals done in a way that delivers, you know, cash on cash outcomes for the GP for the LPs. That's what, you know, that's a big part of what we rely on. Um, and, and and so and so I I tend to once you get to year five, uh, especially with the earlier you know stage invested uh, funds, I, I tend to really focus on DPI more after you know kind of year three into year four into year five, and I expect to start seeing a fair amount of capital either recycled or distributed back um, to uh, to LPs. Um, if that's happening and the IRRs and the MOICs are you know, kind of falling into place, you know, that's the kind of um, fun that you can kind of tuck away and, you know, and hopefully uh, re-up in the next one. Are you going to ask one? Sorry. No, go Randy. One quick specific follow-up to that, because um, I'd, I'd love your your thoughts on it. If a fund has, you know, what was a small position's now done quite well, it's a larger position and it's later, it's past five years and they're doing another round as an opportunity for partial, if not total liquidity, you know, how do you feel on them selling a piece, but keeping a piece if they're still strong believers in what the future will hold versus if you're going to sell some, sell all? Do you have a, a point of view on that or is it purely situational? It, it, it's probably, I don't have a, I, it, I, I have a situational point of view. Um, and, 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 and look, I, I think that if, if, if it's fun, if it's your third or fourth or fifth fund, um, and, you know, you've got a history of, of not only making good investments, but realizing them, and you feel strongly about a particular portfolio company, um, and, uh, you know, you don't want to sell it all, sell, sell some, sell most, you know, sell part of it. But, um, but I think in, in, in situations where it's a first or a second time fund, you know, again, I think, I think putting numbers on the board becomes more and more important. Um, and, and so, um, you know, most, LPs uh, when when they're investing, you know they'll they'll you know they'll they'll tell you they want a twenty percent you know IRR or rate of return and and if you give them thirty but your DPI is really really low that to me is not nearly as good as getting fifteen and having a really high DPI because at least you know in that situation um, you know you know that you know your 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 GP is is both a you know, a good buyer and a good seller. Not every deal is going to be a hundred to one, but you want to make sure that they know how to take the singles and the doubles, you know, along with, you know, the bigger return um, providers. I've heard some people say, you know, that in the early stage uh, venture world, you know, people are, they're less IRR focused. They're more on how many X they're going to get out of the fund. <clears throat> and to get that, you know, multi X, you have to hang on for a little while. So one point of view we've heard recently, somebody said, listen, the mission is get your investors back their money. After that, you can then be much more aggressive, dice rolling, hang longer, um, hope for 
you know, that, you know, multi X, double digit X return, but first get them back their money. Is that just an arbitrary in your mind as you think about that? Is that arbitrary or is it, listen, keep getting them back more money. Never mind, there's nothing special about the amount they put in. But do you have a thought on that? I do. Yeah. I no, I think there's merit to that. Um, I, I don't think it's, you know, black and white. I think the idea of de-risking an investment for a limited partner is an appealing thing. Once someone's money's out, um, you know, anything beyond that is, you know, obviously uh all profit. And and so um there's uh, you know, there's a lot to be there's a lot to be said for that. But I think you have to view it in the context of the environment. Um, and, you know, my concern, I mean, just taking the current environment as an example is, okay, we're now operating in a very low, you know, interest rate world, you know, valuations are frothy. And, you know, I think that there's probably some fairly legitimate concern that, you know, inflation is around the corner. And I would hate to see a company that's, say, uh, a 10 bagger in someone's investment for portfolio um, get re-rated down to being a three times return because the multiple goes from 25 to 10. Um, and that happens. Uh, I don't say that that happens all the time, but it happens enough that there's, you know, a fine line um, between falling in love and hanging on, you know, for, you know, forever and, you know, and, and, and trying to deliver on the charter of your fund which is to deliver, you know, an attractive uh, risk-adjusted rate of return. And part of understanding um, risk is taking into consideration, you know, a whole bunch of factors like the multiples that are prevailing, the interest rate environment that you're in, competitive dynamics. Things can change very quickly. So um, I am a big fan of getting back as much money to investors as quickly as possible, not to the detriment you know, of the long-term outcome of the fund, but I, I don't think, um, you know, uh, GPs should be cavalier about um, in, invest, uh, uh, about, you know, um, rolling investors' funds for too long a period of time if they haven't put good DPI numbers up. Reminds me of the famous old adage uh, that I don't remember the financier who said this, but when asked how he made his fortune, the answer was by always selling too early. Yeah, yeah, you know it's it, it, it's it, it, there's no such thing as a bad profit, right? You know it's uh it, it, you know my 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 view is if you're in the business of making investments, um you know you want to try to you know you want to try to recycle and and turn cash over, you know you know not 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 looking to you know game things or flip things. I'm I'm not a big believer in you know in 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 you know you, you know financial manipulation as a way of, you know, you know, generating your returns. I really do think you get good returns by building great companies. And I know that that takes time. And so, you know, I'm not suggesting that um, anybody that's running a fund, you know, try to get out of something, you know, in a year or two and double their money, because that, you know, generally is not the way things work. But I think, you know, after a proper reasonable period of time, say, you know, four or five, six years, if there's an opportunity to take an attractive return off the table, take your money out, take your money out twice, you know, take something out that's going to make everybody happy. So um, you don't feel like the village idiot, you know, if the floor falls out from underneath you and, you know, that does happen. I have one more, and this is amazing. I love the way your mind works and I, and I want to follow up with some stuff offline too. But one more specific question, which I'd love to hear your thoughts on, what are some perverse incentives that both re exist in reality or exist optically that you try and separate the wheat and the chaff from? You know, some you hear, you know, notionally are, why are you offering that at an SPV versus investing directly? And others have philosophies on, you know, if you made a, an initial investment in one fund and now you've already started your next fund, can you cross funds or shouldn't you? You know, what are, what are your theories on some of these or others that I haven't mentioned? Um, and what is what signal and what's noise? So, I, I mean, you know, look, the, the, you know, the, the investing world has, you know, there's all kinds of different structures and, you know, incentive um, schemes that, I, that I've seen. And some are like kind of perverse. I mean, 
some generally accepted, you know, investment, um, you know, um, structures are, 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 in my opinion, not, you know, all that sensible. I mean, just as an example, I mean, I think I, you know, I always think like, um, like fee structure, like fees should be paid based on invested capital, not committed capital. Um, you know, because I, you know, it just makes more sense to me that if, you know, if, if you're deploying the capital over, you know, a four or five year period, you know, as the capital gets deployed, that the, the fee structure should, you know, should, should, um, you know, should scale with that. So, you know, that, that's something I've, um, I've, uh, I've never, you know, been, um, you know, especially, uh, crazy about, um, you know, I, I, I think on, on, on the, you know, um, on, on, again, on, on the, in the fee category, I've seen, you know, I've seen, you know, um, funds have a, 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 a structure where, um, you know, certain things that, you know, probably should be rebated like board fees, monitoring fees, breakup fees, you know, things like that, you know, are not direct offsets, you know, th those to me should be, um, you know, direct offsets. When it comes to, you know, when it comes to, you know, some of the interesting maneuvering that sometimes happens, I mean, I have some really, you know, good investments in um, some real estate funds and, you know, it took peeling back the layers, you know, of the, you know, of the reports to really understand, understand how much of the returns were coming from the actual performance versus things like deployment of, of subscription lines. Um, and, and subscription lines have been used, you know, I mean, now it's, you know, it, it you know, it's almost ubiquitous. Every, you know, people will generally, you know, borrow for some period of time at LIBOR plus, you know, several hundred basis points to fund capital calls that LPs are generally on the hook for anyway. And so to the LP, it feels like, you know, a very efficient deployment of capital, you know, but in reality, all it's doing is it's juicing the IRR um, by, you know, um, the fund being able to borrow money at a real low rate rather than call equity capital, you know, which has a very high imputed rate of return um, attached to it. So, you know, that that kind of stuff is is a little wacky to me, you know, and 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 then sometimes the use of um, SPVs. I mean, I I like to think, you know, that that when, um, you know, fund managers are offering um, their LPs an opportunity to invest via an SPV, you know, some sort of co-invest vehicle that, you know, it's for a good reason. It's it, it's because, you know, maybe the fund has, you know, deployed as much capital as they feel is prudent and, you know, and there's a good investment opportunity and they want to share it with their partners. That, you know, that makes sense that makes sense to me. Um, but there are there are there are other situations, you know, where there, you know, are sometimes conflicts. It could be, you know, something that's defensive. I mean, there there are you know, one has to really, you know, understand what it is that's being offered and, you know, and make sure that the reasons are sound before, um, you know, before jumping into one of those vehicles, in my opinion. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. There's, you know, I've seen, I've, I've, I've seen quite a few, you know, um, you know, nutty, uh, you know, fun structures in, 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 in my, in my years, but, um, you know, one, one general comment I, I will also make is I do not believe you know, all like, you know, fee slash carry structures should be created equal because they're, you know, the funds and, 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 and the risk parameters and the, you know, and the return objectives are not the same, right? I mean, I don't think there should be a 20% carry for, you know, a low beta infrastructure fund or, you know, a credit fund, or, I mean, even secondary funds, right? Secondary funds, you know, you're going out and you're buying, you know, positions, it could be a GP led secondary, or you're just buying LP positions directly. But, you know, when, when you're investing in a fund that is buying those kinds of assets, well, you know, the assets have already been, you know, diligence, they've already, you know, the company's performed or it hasn't. I mean, so why am I paying 20% for the, I mean, it's just a different risk profile. And, and, yeah. and so, you know, some funds, you know, will use, uh, you know, uh, preferred returns to LPs before there's any carry that, makes sense for Blackstone, right? It wouldn't make sense for a, a small venture fund, right? You know, their, you know, carry structures are generally from dollar one. And so they're all over the place, but sometimes you feel you'll, you'll come across, you know, funds and structures where people just, you know, apply a two and 20 to something where they have no business doing that. You know, I'm going to echo Randy. This is, uh, this is all beef, no filler. This has been <laughs> okay. uh, incredibly helpful. And we, we opened up with, uh, talking about Anil the man, and we're going to close with that. You, and I'd like to 
hear you talk a little bit about what drives you, because you're a guy who is in a very unique position relative to most other humans. You probably could have put your feet up 25 years ago or more and said, you know what? Now I'm going to work on my golf game. And while the rumor is you still do work on your golf game on occasion, oh, well. <laughs> you you have continued to move forward, uh, kind of like the shark, never stopping, doing all sorts of things. What drives you? You know, for 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 me, I, I'm I'm a very competitive person, um, just by by nature, and and so you know, to me, um, what what is motivating is. Um, is success and is um, performance relative to, you know, my competition, my peers. And it's not as if I think I'm in some kind of a, a, a game or a battle against them um, or anyone else for that matter. But it's, um, you know, it's kind of like I like playing golf because, you, you know, you, you, you really it's, it, you know, you're, you're it's it's you against the course. Right. You're not fighting somebody else, you're not playing somebody else. And, and, and I, I think about investing the same way, you know, it, 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 it you know, it, it, you can, you can build great teams. You can, you know, you can, you can, um, you know, have all kinds of different approaches that lead to success in investing. I, as an investor, you know, tend to, you know, do things my way, my style. Um, you know, I've had my successes and my failures, but I, I, I feel like I've got a formula that actually works. And I wake up every morning like excited as hell to apply it. Um, and I'm applying it to different industries at different stages, you know, at different times. And um, I can't think of anything else that gets me more excited, which I realize probably doesn't make me the life of the party. But, um, you know, but it's but it really is truly what I love. I'm passionate about it. And I think if you're going to be, you know, good and committed to something, it's best to be like really, really into it. Well, you, you can feel, I can feel the passion coming through and just looking at things a little differently there. You've had a great life, uh, I think, as a, as a person, as an investor, as a professional. If you could roll the tape back, is there anything you would change aside from a specific investment here or there? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I often say I wish I knew, you know, when I was in my 20s, everything I know now and... Um, you know, because I probably would have ended up owning a lot more of that very first company um, that I helped build um, than I than I owned as a thirty year old. You know, who had who had who had done you know hundreds of millions of dollars of of, of debt and equity financings, um, and and so. Um, but you know, in 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 reality, I, I have I have zero regret regrets looking you know back in in the rearview mirror. I I you know I I I take a, a line that you often repeat, Andy, which is, I think, behind, you know, every scar is a lesson. And I know I have a lot of scar tissue. I want to put all those lessons to work. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm very happy with the path I took. I think being an entrepreneur and, 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 and having to run a business and, you know, and make a payroll and, you know, uh, and, and, and understand what's underneath the numbers, I think, um, provides immense benefit. Uh, as an investor, and so I'm very grateful that my life took the path that it did, um, and and that you know I've had the opportunity to you know be a buyer, be a seller, um, you know, and 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 learn how to evaluate you know um, other companies and other managers through the same prism that you know I was evaluated through. Um, I find it really helpful. So uh, yeah, no, I wouldn't change a thing. Well, I know that sounds like a good note to close on a life well lived. And no regrets. Uh, really appreciate your time, your insights, uh, and your perspective. And uh, we look forward to uh, perhaps doing a round two uh, same time next year. I would look forward to it. I, I, I would be my pleasure. And thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm happy to do this.